simple I'd like to tell you about. But it's a simple solution to a problem that's been in the back of my mind for about 10 years. And it's a problem whose history goes even further back in time. So what I'd like to do is begin with the story and then work back to the problem and solution. And this is the story of ML type inference and how it's been explained over the years in more and more pedagogical ways. So in the beginning, in the 70s, was Robin Milner, um, who came up at the same time with ML polymorphism and ML type inference. And he wrote a landmark paper in 78, where there were two algorithms, W and J. Uh, w was slightly more declarative, it was purely functional, and it manipulated substitutions and compositions of substitutions, so it was slightly messy, even though it was very brilliant. And J looked slightly more friendly, a bit uh, closer to what, you would to what you would write when you actually implemented the algorithm. And the reason for that was that there was a global variable which contained the so-called current substitution. And this allowed most of the code to be written in a, in a rather uh, readable style. Even though the two algorithms are really the same at heart, and they both work with most general unifiers and compositions of them, and they create new variables, whatever that means, when needed. So that was the state of the art in 70, uh, 78 actually. And in the following decades, people gradually made progress towards explaining this in simpler ways. Because as you may see, this is not something that's easily taught or explained to someone who doesn't know. So in the 80s, um, several researchers tried to explain type inference in simpler ways. Um, some, some of it was folklore already, but it was only written down in the 80s. In particular, Cardelli and Wand uh, explained or tried to explain type inference as a two-stage process. They said, look, it's all very simple, really. It's just solving systems of equations between types. So this can be done in two phases. First, you generate your system of equations, your conjunction of equations. I'm going to call that a constraint. And then, in a second stage, you solve the constraint. So that's beneficial for several reasons. Uh, maybe the two more most important reasons are that you have a higher level of abstraction when you think in terms of constraints. Uh, conjunctions and equations are something you learn in high school, whereas substitutions and compositions are really unfriendly. And also, it's more modular because with some luck, the constraint solver and, and the syntax of constraints have some potential for reuse. You can implement a library that's going to be used by several programming language designers. Today, for instance, perhaps the, the Haskell type inference engine and the OCaml type inference engine, in an, in an ideal world, could be written based on a single library for solving constraints. So that's not the case, but still, the idea is there. Uh, in the 80s, though, there remained some problems. This generation of new variables wasn't explained, and polymorphism was actually not supported by this two-stage explanation, because um, algorithm J and W, they solve the constraints at midway before they can produce more constraints. They intertwine generation and solving in a way that was not explained at the time. So in the 90s, more progress was made. In particular, um, Kirchner and Joanneau, and also my PhD advisor, Didier Rémy, came up with ways of explaining uh, solving in, in nicer ways. In particular, generating new variables is, is explained in terms of existential quantification, sorry. And solving is explained in terms of rewriting constraints. So you, you change your constraints step by step while preserving its logical meaning until you reach a solved form. And the five rules up there are a description of unification, which is fairly nice, as it corresponds quite closely to an efficient implementation, actually. And, and this may seem a little step, just adding the existential modifiers and explaining things in terms of rewriting, but it's an enabling step before the next improvement could be made in, in the 2000s. In the 2000s, there was an interesting paper by Gustafsson and Svenningsen, uh, 
they were working on a static analysis system with subtyping constraints, and they also wanted to explain polymorphism. And they came up with this idea that you could explain that using constraint abstractions. And that's an idea which Didier Rémy and I use to explain Hindemann type inference too. So this is what it looks like today, what's, what you can find in the introduction of the paper. This is the constraint language which I'm using at the moment. And there you find unification constraints plus two new forms, uh, abstraction and application, which allow you to define macros, so to speak, constraint macros. The let form allows you to bind the name X to a macro, uh, which can then be applied to a type toe. Uh, so, so when you do that, a kind of macro expansion takes place, if you will, conceptually at least. That's one way of thinking of it. And this allows you to write more compact constraints potentially exponentially more compact. And, and this is an important idea in particular because it allows you to really explain uh, type inference as a two-stage process. And this fits in these four equations. Uh, there you can actually, given a program T and a, an expected type toe, you can generate a constraint, which is a necessary and sufficient condition for this uh, term to have type toe. So I'm not going to read those equations, but the two in the middle are essentially those found in Watt's paper from the 80s, and the first and last lines used uh, constraint abstractions to explain polymorphism without mixing constraint generation and constraint solving. So this may look a little mysterious, perhaps too magic, but actually it does explain something in the sense that you can take these constraints and solve them step by step. There is a set of rewriting rules which describes the constraint solver, and you can actually implement, implement that efficiently and reduce every constraint that way to a solved form, which is either a false or the most general unifier, essentially. In OCaml, if you're, if you're an OCaml programmer and you want to think in these terms, you can, you can define a library which defines the abstract syntax of constraints, a function fresh for creating new variables, and you can derive some simple combinators which allow you to build constraints more easily. And in particular, exist combines fresh with, with an application of the data constructor, C exist. This allows you to transliterate the mathematical definition of constraint generation into OCaml code. So maybe that's not obvious, but it's almost exactly the same thing as the mathematical definition. And this allows you then to easily, uh, hopefully, easily do type inference. And that's where the problem appears. The problem I, I've been thinking about, um, and whose answer I couldn't really find during those 10 years, since the material I just showed is 10 years old. The problem is if I start with a closed program, I have written this nice OCaml or Haskell program. I want to know if it's well typed. I'm going to submit it to the constraint generator, which will produce a closed constraint since the program is closed. The constraint will be closed too. Everything will be nicely bound. Then I submit that to the constraint solver. And what does the constraint solver do with a closed constraint? Well, obviously it's going to rewrite it to a closed sort form. And that's either false or true which means, essentially, the solver says, yes, your program is well-timed. And that's kind of anticlimactic because what I wanted to know was, was what's the type of this program and how should I annotate every lambda? Where should I put the type abstractions so that I now have an explicitly typed program? Perhaps I want to do this because I'm, I want to define a function elaborate which actually turns my program into a system F term, for instance, because I'm writing a type-directed compiler. So, the question I'm looking at is, can I keep my elegant story, which is the, the result of several decades of uh, pedagogical research, so to speak, uh, can I keep this, this nice elegant story with a nice separation between constraint generation and constraint solving, and at the same time be able to explain how I construct uh, a system F term? So, the solution, or at least a solution. I'm going to begin with a, a low-level low solution, so to speak, which is fairly natural, and explain why I'm not completely happy with it. And then what I will add on top of that is a, a tiny idea, really, which allows me to write this code in a more pleasing way. 
So the so-called low-level solution, it's, it's one that's implemented in, in GHC, for instance, or something close to what I'm describing here. It's a fairly natural idea, which is that the generator should not produce just a constraint. It should produce um, a constraint with mutable holes in it, which the solver will fill with information. And these mutable holes, they can also be shared with what I'm calling a template here, a template for the elaborated term. So when the solver runs, it fills this mutable evidence. The template gets, as a side effect, uh, gets filled with evidence too. And then if I, if I want to obtain an immutable system F term in the end, I can just traverse my template and turn it into an immutable term. So this works. And I'm actually going to modify, show how my library should be modified to do this, because I'm going to build on top of this later on. So the constraints which I'm using should contain uh, mutable placeholders for evidence. And for instance, um, in the case of the existential quantifier, um, it already has two arguments, a variable and, and a body, a sub-constraint. And I, here I already have the placeholder that I need, because it's the, just that type variable. It's an abstract type, but internally I'm going to implement it as uh, some kind of mutable <coughs> data structure. It's really going to be some kind of pointer into the unifier's mutable state. So here I don't need to add anything. But in some of the other cases, which I'm not showing um, in the interest of, of time, uh, in the case of constraint abstractions in particular, I'm going to need to actually add some new mutable placeholders um, so that the user knows where capital lambdas type abstractions must be inserted, for instance. So the library has to offer a decoder, what I'm calling a decoder, it's just a, a function which must be called after the solver has run, that's a key point. And it's going to inspect the unifier's mutable state and turn my variable, which is just a pointer into that state, into an actual type in, in a format that the user of the library can easily understand. So you can think of TY as, as a system F type that's been completely decoded. So now the user of the library has to write two functions. Um, has type is almost like before, except it produces not just a constraint, but also a template for the elaborated term. And I have this trivial, kind of trivial function solidify, which just traverses the template and, and reads the evidence, which has been filled, and produces a, an immutable system F term. So I don't like that very much, even though it works, because it's not very pretty if you want to write a paper about that. Well, maybe you can, but it's kind of hard to explain. Um, one thing I don't like is that the user has to deal with every language construct twice, uh, in, in the function has type and in the function solidify. And also, this mutable evidence is exposed to the user, and it's not just mutable, it also involves names and binders because it involves type variables and the user has to understand exactly where they're bound. So it's a bit tricky. And the, the, the idea that I'm trying to explain now is uh, just a little trick to hide this mutable evidence and offer to the user an interface that's much nicer, I think. So the wish is that I would like to um, unify the two, the, the, the stages one and three, so what I'm calling stages one and three are generation and solidification, so to speak, with solving in the middle. So solving has to be executed in the, in the middle because it has to compute that mutable evidence. But I, was, I would still be able to, I would still like to be able to describe um, stages one and three in just one place in my code. So I have to somehow fold my code back so that I can write that in one place. Another thing, another way of thinking of this problem is to say, if I could magically construct the constraint and at the same time query the solver for the solution of certain variables, for the final value of certain type variables, then it would be easy. I, I, in one go, I could trivially perform my elaboration. So of course I can't do that because I can't query the solver before it has run, but actually I can give the user the illusion that this is taking place just by providing the user 
with the right set of combinators, with the right special purpose language, so to speak, the right DSL. And this DSL, it turns out, we have it already. It's just the syntax of constraints. With one more combinator, we just need a map combinator in addition to the existing syntax of constraints. Um, I, I also need to extend slightly my understanding of constraints. I'm going to think of them at, this, at, at the same time as constraints and computations. As I just suggested a couple slides ago, yeah, one could think of constraints as computations that emit constraints, read their solutions, and, and produce a value as a result. And the value, in my case, is going to be the elaborated term. So now I'll have this type alpha constraint or alpha computation. So you can think of this as either a constraint or a computation, which produces a result of type alpha. So the solver, when you give it such a constraint, it will do the solving, it will do the evaluation, and eventually produce a value of type alpha. And the combinators which are exposed are essentially the same as before, although they have different name, names. A pure is really the true constraint, it's always true. Uh, conjunction is the same as before, except it produces a pair of values, naturally. And map is just a way of performing a little piece of computation in OCaml, in the host language. So it's a way of post-processing the result produced by a constraint. And the existential quantifier is almost the same as before, except if your constraint inside produces an alpha, then the existentially quantified constraint produces a pair of a type and an alpha. And this type that appears here is the final value uh, for the type variable whose solution you're looking for. So this gives the user the illusion that the solutions to the constraints are there as you're building the constraints. I need to go a little bit faster. I just, just say that the implementation of this is very easy. It's just the tiny type definitions and a few and a tiny set of combinators. And this allows the user to define inference and elaboration in just one recursive function, which is exactly the same as before. The changes are in blue. Instead of directly producing, just producing a constraint as before, I'm now producing a constraint with a value, and the value will be uh, a system F term. And in the code, I'm using the map combinator. The double dollars is notation for map. And this allows me to process the results produced by the constraint in black above. And in this constraint in black, I have two type variables, v1 and v2. And as a result, kind of magically, I get the two types, tie1 and tie2, which are the, the, the appropriate solutions. They're, they're the solutions for the type variables v1 and v2. And this thing turns to be an applicative functor, not a monad, hence the the title of the paper. Okay, I'll conclude now. So it's really a very simple idea, as you could see. Uh, I, I spent most of the talk explaining the history and the problem, and, and the solution actually is very, very simple. So it's just icing on the cake, if you will. But I like the fact that you can explain elaboration in just one slide, provided you have the right set of combinators to begin with. And I think this is something that could be taught, for instance, although I haven't attempted to do so yet, but maybe next year or in a couple of years. And this might be usable in other settings, who knows? That's um, the future to tell. Thank you. Hi, Edward from Stanford. Uh, I was just wondering, um, would lazy evaluation work for this trick? Or is there like some place where it doesn't? Um, I don't think it would work. This um, unification is a non-local thing, and you never know the final value of a variable until you have solved the entire constraint. So basically, the elaboration phase really needs to take place after solving. Uh, I don't think an on-demand approach would help here. Well, so what you would do is you would tie the knot with the result of having solved the constraints. So mm -hmm. 
I, I don't know. I, yeah, I, maybe, I haven't tried it. So maybe instead of using mutable placeholders, you could insert lazy suspensions, which you force later. I'm not sure. Oh, I basically have the same question. <laughs> so, could you just go back two slides? They're the one in which you showed the, um, uh, the code. Yes, here. So, this is kind of an open question. But I really like what you're describing, but I don't like this code because it's got this, you know, fun of Taiwan, come on, Taiwan, this very point free style, right? Yeah. And to understand that structure, you have to look at the structure of the code above. It's all much less good than naming the intermediate. So, it's kind of. Um, yeah, uh, it's true that the connection should, between V1 and time one is not really clear here. Yeah, yeah. so we should, we should just find a, a, a better way to express the fact. In, 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 you, you correctly said in the paper you can't use a monad for this because then you could depend on time one too early. You just need a way to uh, say you could depend on it without, uh, to, to have a better way to express this kind of code. Yeah, without. I guess this is an, an example of the need for a notation. Better notation for using an application or, or types or something. Yeah. So there's, yeah. there's something uncomfortable here. So I don't have a solution. For yeah, but, but do it, you should have come done. to my talk at WGP. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. And also, I think uh, oh, I missed it already. Simon Marlowe's talk, the or paper, he mentions something along these lines. So cool. maybe we'll hear something like fixable. Yes. Any other questions? You mentioned for that for the implementation, you could rely to produce imperative approach, so it was very simple. But if you had to do it from scratch, would you redo it this way again? Or is there a new implementation that is made available by this new interface? If I had to redo the whole thing from scratch, or? The implementation of the elaboration with this. Um, well, actually, I, I did write a prototype from scratch the time to check the ideas in the paper. And I, I, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's the best way of approaching the problem and structuring the solution. I don't know of a better way. We have time for one more question. Uh, Phil Bogley, University of Edinburgh. This is beautiful work. Um, I was wondering about different approach. So you mentioned the difficulty is that when you solve a constraint, the answer is true or false. What if one took a proposition as types approach and said, well, no, the, the answer should be the proof that the constraint is satisfied, in which case exists, you'd have to provide the um, instantiation for the existential variable. Yes, you could do that. Um, I think there is a note in the paper concerning that. So indeed, you could produce some kind of proof tree saying, here is why the constraint is true. But then the user would still have to uh, decode this proof tree, inspect the proof tree, and use it to build the system F term. So the user would still have to write two inductive functions, constraint generation and then inspection of the proof tree. And I, I don't like this idea that you have to do things twice. And, and the point here is that you have to write only one inductive function. Right, yes, so I, I see how that's, maybe your nice way of doing it could be expressed in terms of the um, proposition as types view of solving constraints rather than the one you've done with uh, assignment. The final story yeah, is just yeah. as nice, but this is it's, true, um, it's true that the low-level interface, which uses mutable evidence, could be different. Uh, it could be it could rely on, on proof trees the way you suggest. I guess in the end, it's not very important because you only expose the high-level interface. But we, one could follow the path you suggest. Let's thank the speaker again.